of course, in some parts of the world, if culture teaches to kill infidels rooted in scriptures like the Quran, rooted in other scriptures or holy texts, or anything they hold sacred like the Hadith, so of course we're going to have, for example, some radical Muslims. According to Rand, R-A-N-D, I don't know if you mentioned Rand, but Rand is basically an institution, a non-profit institution in Santa Monica. Since 1972, Rand has studied terrorism trends. According to Rand, 96% of terrorism is Islamic terrorism, 96%, which means that only 4% of terrorism is non-Islamic terrorism. So why? Why do so many Muslims, relative to other religions, want to kill us? The answer is easy, very easy. It's seven letters, culture. What I've given you so far is social blue, a blueprint that's anchored and planted on your brain. And there is a place in the Middle East where culture is enacted through classes, and it's an Islamic school, it's called a madrasa. And a country like Pakistan has 40,000 madrasas, 40,000, serving millions of students. So of course you're gonna have more terrorists there than in other places on Earth, places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Maghreb, and you mentioned Al-Qaeda. Now Al-Qaeda is actually uh, planting itself in Northern Africa. And they say that the head of Al-Qaeda is in Algeria, the body is in Mali, and the tentacles are in Nigeria and Libya. Because most of the people there are Muslims, of course Al-Qaeda will find its place there. And they will play up that cultural uh, aspect of life, which will shape minds and sadly future killers. It's the idea. Because we have culture, we have symbolic interactionism. I'm in the School of Communication, so I like to use a lot of <coughs> communication theories. And what culture teaches us is that we learn how to communicate, we learn how to write, we learn things through a theory of communication called symbolic interactionism, which, which says that in America, this means victory. That's what my culture teaches me. That's symbolic interactionism. In other cultures, they have other signs that we don't know. So imagine that symbolic interactionism from the cradle until you're an adult teaches you to hate. Let me give an example, okay? The Quran uses the term jihad 41 times. Jihad, holy war, and the idea of killing infidels, that's being used in the Quran 41 times. That's an example right there. If you, there was a pupil that was conducted in Lebanon, in countries like Jordan, countries like Saudi Arabia. In Lebanon, for instance, more than 70% of the people who were polled believe in suicide bombing. That should be justified. The cultural worship of Osama bin Laden, and we never hear that stuff in the media, how people worship bin Laden in the Middle East. There was a pupil in Jordan about how they feel about bin Laden. 60% of the Jordanians think that bin Laden was like the rock star from Mars. He was their descendant, ready to kill, and everything he did was justifiable. In Pakistan, 51% of the people there were supporting uh, Osama bin Laden. Can you see how culture can shape minds? In those countries, they have candies wrapped with bin Laden's face on it. They have t-shirt, they have tele they have CDs and DVDs about bin Laden just extolling the virtues of Islam and how it's normal to kill, how it's acceptable to kill. So it really becomes capital, cultural capital. See, cultural capital is anything that the culture produces, cultural assets. So in our country, cultural capital is American Idol. And as we know, more people vote for American Idol than they vote for politicians. That's our culture. I'm being zanny, I'm being facetious. In other cultures, of course, things can go well, cannot go well. But you know what I mean. It's a cultural worldview that really tells people how to think. Now, in our culture, what has changed, as you pointed out, is political correctness. Why don't we call a spade a spade? Why is the Fort Hood shooting workplace violence? If, if we keep going that path, Pearl Harbor will be workplace violence. <laughs> Hopefully that ain't going to happen. Things have changed in our culture, and hopefully 
uh, political correctness will go away. I call that cultural Marxism. See, political correctness, I'm from Belgium, by the way, as you can hear. I don't sound like an uh, Orlandoan. <laughs> in my country, in the country of Belgium, all the news stations, all the media outlets are owned by the government. There is no freedom of speech. Every time my mom will post something on, on a website, like the local newspaper, they will erase it. Ah, oh, you're telling the truth. Ah. Fortunately, even though we have political correctness, let's face it, we still have Fox News and Michael Savage and Rush Limbaugh. You may not agree with them, but America really is the, one of the few countries that really has a freedom of speech. Uh, all you have to do is take a five-hour flight. Let's go north. Well, let's go to Montreal or Toronto. In those places, there is no freedom of speech. In 2011, and that's part of their new culture, in 2011, they passed a new law, a new federal law in Canada. Anybody who tells the truth, anybody who just criticizes any religion, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, will receive a fine. And if the person refuses to pay a fine, will go to jail. It's not happening here yet. Maybe, maybe our administration is trying to pass that policy. Hopefully it will not succeed. I'm, I'm telling you, America is the last bastion for culture and freedom of speech. Now, going back to the outline, oh, I digressed a little bit, but I, I had to share that with you. Going back to the outline, there is something called uncertainty avoidance and collectivism. And those are two cultural ways of life that a lot of terrorist groups live by. And there is a documentary on radical Islam called Suicide Killers. It's on YouTube, Suicide Killers. And basically, that documentary is 60 minutes and will answer most of your questions as to why we have so many people hating us. It's culture. And part of their culture is that life on Earth is uncertain. And just, of course, poor economic conditions and uh, misery. And life in paradise is very certain. And their culture teaches them that once they kill people in the process, if they lose their lives, but they kill infidels in the process, they will have certainty of life in paradise. The Quran says that in multiple places. Chapter 9, verse 111. The Quran forbids suicide except for one thing. Okay? If you kill infidels in the process, then it's fine. Chapter 9, verse 111. If you kill infidels and you die in the process, you will reach the highest place in paradise. Chapter 4, verse 74. Same, same idea. The hadith, and by definition, a hadith is a collection of sayings by the Prophet Muhammad. The Quran is their holy scripture, and the hadith is what people gathered from what they heard from Muhammad. And they compiled everything and it became a hadith. There are, there are a lot of hadiths. Some of them have less value, less truth. But Al-Bukhari is the main scholar that people believe. I mean, they believe in what he wrote. And he's the main author for, for the hadith. And according to Al-Bukhari, if you do kill infidels, if you do follow what Muhammad said, it's going to be 72 virgins and 80,000 servants. And that's certainty in paradise. Uncertainty here, certainty in paradise. And you, you know, those suicide killers were interviewed, and I want my children, my children are five, when they grow up, I don't want them to be like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man. I want them to be like me. I want them to do the same thing. I want them to kill infidels and to enjoy life in paradise. Hmm. If a woman is a suicide bomber, she becomes one of the 72 virgins, and she can choose the most beautiful husband. I'm just giving you a few Zani examples to illustrate what culture teaches. And I want our government to understand that. Instead of avoiding the issue, instead of being in denial. How about our government uh, just allows our teachers to tell the truth about things like that in the classroom? How about we call a spade a spade? Uh, that's what we need to fight for. Now the other term is collectivism. In a lot of the cultures that favor, that really foment the idea of killing infidels, there's, there's a big sense of fellowship, the idea that we have to take care of each other. And fellowship has a better term. According to Hofstede, it's collectivism. 
the idea that the group is more important, no individual thinking, you need to do this for the group. And we have a lot of martyrs in the Middle East, and the concept of martyrdom is the idea that you die for the group. The Ummah would be the large Muslim group worldwide. Ummah. You die for the group. In the Palestinian territories, and that's very important, in the Palestinian territories, culture will have a set of rules. If your son commits suicide and kill a lot of people in the process, like the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, your son will have his picture after he dies, your son will, will, have, will be on a poster in the street of Ramallah. It's almost like just walking on Hollywood Boulevard, you see DiCaprio, you see Justin Bieber, maybe not that one, but you know what I mean. Then you go to the Palestinian territories, and you see Hollywoodian look, I mean, people who look like Hollywoodian stars. There are people who kill so many other people, but they revert as stars. Of course, that's going to be incentivizing. And the family gets $2,800 a year. It's about something like $40 to $50 a week as a compensation because their son uh, became a martyr. And you see how, what culture teaches. In conclusion, if I can put it that way, there's really a clash of civilizations between their culture and our culture. It's really a war of ideas. The term clash of civilizations was actually coined by a brave professor from the East Coast who passed away, Sam Huntington, in the mid-90s. And really, Islam and the West are incompatible. If Islam teaches this and we teach that, how can we, how can we join forces? How can we agree on a lot of things? Now, don't get me wrong, there are some cultural Muslims. Uh, they're not the problem, they're not the solution either. When was the last time you heard a cultural Muslim criticizing a radical Muslim? When was the last time you had a cultural Muslim complaining about the ben Benghazi fiasco? I want to hear them. Then I'll give them a million dollars. It's a safe bet. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> And really, it's a clash of civilizations, a war of ideas. If jihad is mentioned 41 times, you've got the picture right there. If they want to impose Sharia, which is Islamic law, if they want to impose Sharia in all the places that they conquered, how, is, how can that be compatible with the Constitution? Where I come from, in Brussels, Belgium, there are more Muslims than Christians, Jews, and Buddhists combined. In 1974 in France, in France, in 1974, you had one mosque, the Great Mosque of Paris. It, as of 2013, you have 2,300 2300 mosques. So the number of mosques in France has increased by 23,000%. You have the beautiful cathedral of Cologne in Germany. Now, next to the beautiful cathedral of Cologne, they're building a mosque that's going to be as twice as large and as twice as big. Mm. In the UK, in England, you have 90 Sharia courts that operate outside British jurisprudence, which means that each Sharia court in England has its own judge. It's a Muslim judge that allows the husband to beat his wife. Remember, they have Sharia zones, and the, the British government has no say. Now, is this what we want in the United States? So how do you change a culture? That's another $64 million dollar question. How do you change a culture? Well, you don't try to change it. You just resist it. Let's call a spade a spade. The Fort Hood shooting was terrorist. We need to resist culture, especially cultural invasion. I came to this country because I like the American way. I like this country. I'm pro-American. And if, my, if this country becomes like Belgium, we're doomed. It's the idea. Well, uh, it's going to be almost seven. Any questions? I'm sure you have questions. Yes, sir. You mentioned that Islam and the West are completely different, and really, I'm assuming they can't ever agree, which is what's happening in Israel and the Palestinians. Exactly the same thing. That's right. The tell them they should negotiate. The Israelis should negotiate with the Palestinians, but there's no way they can. And all you have to do is go to the website of the Palestinian Authority or, or Hamas that Palestinian terrorist group. You know what it says, among many things? Our mission is to push, to push the Jews into the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So how can you negotiate with them? 
Well, do you think that the White House allowing Muslim Brotherhood uh, activists to be on the White House staff is, is denial? So it's, how can they be in denial? It's, there, you know, three answers. Some of them are in denial. Some of them are in bed with them. And some of them are just afraid. They, they've been cowed by our enemy. What about the five point, what is it, $1.5 billion given to the Muslim Brotherhood? Is there something wrong with that picture? Our money? Well, it's probably money. more than that. <laughs> yeah, but that's a start. Right. And we've given Pakistan, listen, from 2002 to 2012, we gave Pakistan $23 billion. What did they do in, its, in just what you in return? They were hiding bin Laden. That was our, our compensation. That was expensive. <laughs> yes, Karen. Everybody, please. Karen. John. Well, I, I will answer your question this way. Many people have. Yes. Okay. I need to repeat the question I'm being taken. So your question is: uh, Is Islam a religion? In the examples that I gave you, are they just based? Are they based on religion or culture? I can answer your question this way. Islam is not just a religion. It's an ideology. It's a political ideology which encompasses culture and religion. So it's not just a religious problem there on that front. It's a whole cultural, it's a whole political agenda. And you're talking about a caliphate. I think one of the, the main mission of a lot of Muslims and Muslim leaders worldwide is to establish a caliphate across the world. A caliphate is a grand Islamic state. And they want every country to impose Sharia. Under Sharia, uh, you know, we were being told how to walk, how to talk, I mean, what to, what to wear, and women will have way fewer rights. And everything conflicts with the Declaration of Human Rights. The United Nations passed the Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. What did it say? Every country has no right punishing anybody because of their religion, the way they dress, and women shall have the same rights as men. You have 57 Islamic countries, and I think that 56 Islamic countries out of 57 have violated that Declaration of Human Rights by a large measure. Just my, my second point was just, it's just an observation more of, um, and I found this to be true in my own life, but the Islamic State is really not the How can you? So, how do you want to strengthen our civilization by welcoming, for instance, well, radical I'm Islamic beliefs? So what you resist or whatever you focus on actually can Just think it's a, um, you know, something I know that I've. Well, actually, no. European countries made a huge mistake. They quit resisting, so they unfolded the red carpet for other Muslim families to come, and now, now. A country like England has to say yes to polygamy, has to say yes to honor killing. France, for a long time in France, you could not have any polygamy. Now they have so many Muslims, 8 million of them. And the size of France is like the size of Texas. They have 8 million Muslims in France. They have to say yes to polygamy. They have to kowtow to Muslim immigrants because they have so many of them. So I'd rather take the chance and resist uh, what is our enemy than actually just give up and embrace, I mean, those those foreign cultures. Yeah, he was before. Yes, I'll be with you. Yeah. Um, I had a question that you brought up earlier, yes. which was, um, I wanted to know what your opinion was, because it was brought up about the um, gun control issue. And with the gun control, if you have an opinion as to what the ultimate um, if you can please speak louder. end game is to to the, the enforcement of gun control, the way that this administration is trying to enforce it, do you, and how that plays in possibly to the resistance or non-resistance of the of, um, terrorists coming in. 
So your question is, is that is those new are those new policies on gun control part of a long-term agenda to control us? Uh, if they pass, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, you know, listening to your talk and your answer, Sandy Adams can probably testify in the halls of Congress, uh, the word republic is said once a day with Pledge of Allegiance. And the rest of the day, they talk about the America, the democracy, um, which is the tyranny of the mob. And, you know, all this collectivism that you've been talking about, um, you know, healthcare, you sacrifice yourself for the benefit of the group. The gun control, you make yourself more vulnerable to the benefit of the group. Uh, class warfare, well, you know, the, you have to punish the 1% for the benefit of the group. So we have this in spades in the United States. And, you know, you say it's the last bastion of hope. It doesn't seem to be a whole lot of hope left in America. Okay. Well, there's still hope. As long as we have free speech, there's still hope. But that's all I can say. Yes. Uh. My interpretation of all this is that since we can't negotiate with them, and the only thing a bully understands is force, and the only thing we have is to educate and resist with all our might. Is that my correct understanding? Yes, that's the correct okay. understanding. In my opinion, is the correct way. Thank you. Yes, sir. Using the sports analogy, we're really playing a game. Unfortunately, we're using Western logic as our rules, dealing with an opponent who is using non-Western logic for their rules. Now, how do we play by their rules? We get rid of, of uh, political correctness, number one. And perhaps it may mean lowering our standards to their levels to play by their rules? So your question is, how do we play by their rules? Well, the answer is 4,000 years old. Know thy enemy. And that was a quote by Sun Tzu. Unless you know your enemy, unless you you just use their means against them, uh, we're not going to win this war. Amen. Good. Yes, sir. Your name? Um, I'm Andrew Smith. Um, this evening, you've gone ahead, you've identified that um, terrorism is shaped by culture, um, and you've gone ahead and again identified that Islam is a major factor or a major culture in play of this terrorism. Um, we've addressed how to resist it, that it's spreading. Um, we've addressed the problem. What, what is the solution? We, we've talked about how we don't want it to continue, but how are we going to go ahead and retract it? Because obviously terrorism is something that's going to continue, and it's inevitable. But at the large scale that we have right now, if it's going to continue at this rate, it's going to be unsustainable for our culture to have to live within it. So what is the solution? We've talked about the problem. What is the solution to try and you know repair it? Resistance is just you know. So we're 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 sitting there. We're saying that we're going to call it terrorism. We can call it terrorism, or we can call it a tickle fight. It doesn't matter what we call it. I, I, I'm not trying to... Right. But the thing is, we can call it whatever we want to, and that will paint a picture in our head of what it actually is. So, so I understand how we're resisting it, but how are we affecting what their, their actions are part of? So what is the solution to elect politicians with fire in the belly? And the place to take it is to the local level. We know that it's not working in the White House because the Muslim Brotherhood is just in bed with them. So I think that by electing local politicians, those who clearly understand our enemies, those who are willing to fight and pass policies and laws uh, that are pro-American, that would be the solution. An example of this is ALAC, A-L-A-C, American Laws for American Courts. And so that addresses the, the, I guess, the issue locally of not having it spread here, what about, you know, Al-Qaeda and the terrorist groups abroad that are coming and affecting our country? How, how are we supposed to, you know, how are we supposed to address that issue? When, I mean, so that will address the domestic issue, but what about the... Well, the Al-Qaeda coming here, that's not up to us. That's not up well, to no, Homeland Security. I, I, I understand that. But what I'm saying, we're talking about the, the, the terrorism, the cultural root of terrorism. So how are we going to address that root? Right. You're wanting to know how do we address the cultural root? How do we how do we respond basically? Yeah, yeah. Of, there's a, what's the answer? The answer is education. 
The, edu the answer is we educate and we get rid of the political correctness. And we say what it is and why we believe what it is, what it is. You know, we, one of the things I filed, which in my lifetime, as a law enforcement officer, being in the military, growing up in a military family, I never in a million years would have thought that I would have found it necessary to file a bill that says that we only have American laws in our American courts. In other words, no other form of foreign law in our courts. In other, because if it isn't a duly created law by our electoral process, in other words, it went through our legislative process, it went through the courts, it is constitutional, then we, we're not going to have other four laws in our courts. I found it necessary to file that piece of legislation. I was working on one in the state when I got elected to the uh, U.S. House. The U.S. House, I filed it. And the first thing that happened was I went under attack because I was attacking somebody's, another religion, or I was, no. What I was simply stating, and what we need to be able to stand up and say is that we have a constitution. It is the basis of how we operate in this country, and it has done so for over 200 years. We follow that constitution, and our laws are created through our constitutional ways, through the legislative process, and some that have crea been created because of the court rulings and precedents set by our courts. But each and every one of them have gone through a process where you had the opportunity to elect the person who was up there making those laws. You had a say in it. American people have a say in it. So that's how we act. That's how we respond. That's what we need to do. And the education is important because we have seen so many people wanting to sidestep, be very careful not to offend. And I get that. But I also get the fact that we need to put away political correctness when it comes to dealing with this issue especially because it is a terrorist attack. What happened in Fort Hood was a terrorist attack. It wasn't workplace violence. Amen. This is something that we need to recognize and deal with head on. If we do not, it's going to grow. And for those that are in law enforcement, we all know that it started growing in our, our, our uh, prisons. Mm -hmm. So this is not something that's just popped over overnight. It's been here for years, and it's been growing. Thank you. Lots of fingers. <laughs> How about you help me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You have, yes. Um, quiet question. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. I think what we need is a clear definition of who is an infidel. Uh, on the one hand, uh, here's what I, pardon, um, Israel, uh, the promise of the return of Israel was made in the Bible, it was repeated in the Gospel, it's in the Quran. So those who would violently oppose the long-awaited fulfillment of an ancient prophecy would appear to me to be the infidels, and they're the ones who are calling everybody else infidels. Um, and with that kind of perspective, then you realize that the American soldiers who die fighting the terrorists are the martyrs because they're killing the infidels. But so long as we let them, let the infidels call everybody else infidels, we're playing their game. In the Quran, I'll answer the question, so who is the infidel? In the Quran, the infidels are the people of the book. And the people of the book are the people mentioned in the Bible. No. That is Christians and Jews, according to the Quran. No. Yes. No. The infidels are the ones that don't the God. No, 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 people of the book. It's mentioned a hundred times in the Quran. Christian yeah. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, name's Will. Uh, one of the issues that I've seen is basically today's youth. You, you, they're the ones you commonly see out protesting the war. They're the ones out telling everybody else the Muslims aren't that bad. It's okay to have them here. How do you go about fixing it? It's people my age and Yes. So why are people so people are fighting for global peace? But you know people are like sponges. They you know they believe what they hear and see on TV without absorbing, without processing what they hear and see on TV. So unless we educate them, unless we tell them the truth, and by the way, 
Uh, I wrote a book on the subject, it's 500 pages on terrorism and communication. I promise you that will educate you. So unless you educate people on the subject, uh, they will keep believing the media and just being sponges. Um, it's like a comment my dad just made. When I was in high school, they didn't even teach the Constitution anymore. Is it because teachers have no say, or because they have just to follow an agenda? They have no view on everything. They don't see things that just don't they see things in an entirely different view than what would actually help the country, what the country needs. So the question is, why are students not being taught the truth in the classroom? And you're talking about uh, public high schools. Either teachers uh, refuse to tell the truth in the classroom, or they don't have any power to do so. I think it's also related to what you talked about with, uh, with uh, textbooks and whatnot. The textbooks are changing, so it's not even teaching real history. It's teaching what they want history to have been. That, uh, you know, shows us in a bad light as Americans. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke briefly about France and Germany. Uh, during the last couple of years, both Sarkozy and, and Merkel have said that they realized the, the danger of being politically correct and how vulnerable it made them. What are they doing in France and Germany now to reverse their own culture of political correctness? Very good question. So how can Germans and uh, the French reverse their own culture? Uh, I will answer your question by talking about the fertility rate. Very important. In terms of culture, when the fertility rate in a country or culture is 2.1 or more, it means that people are procreating and the culture is surviving. 2.1. That's the statistical point. Very important. When when in a culture the fertility rate and by the way fertility rate is the number of children per woman alive when the fertility rate is below 2.1 uh, the culture is in danger when it's below 1.8 the culture is irreversible the fertility rate in spain is 1.3 in italy is 1.5 in france is 1.8 so this is what i this is the, that's I gave you a statistic about half an hour ago. 54 million Islamic immigrants uh, are living in Europe. In a lot of European countries, uh, their culture is irreversible. It's impossible to, re to reverse. The German government, a couple of years ago, admitted that Germany will become an Islamic republic by 2050. Unless they resort to a civil war. Unless they have more kids. <laughs> I'm serious. All right. All right. In Spain, they have check bebe, baby checks. The Spanish government is incentivizing people to have babies so that Spanish culture will not die out. It's not working. Two thousand euros have babies. That should be incentivizing. Yes. The question is with Islam. It hasn't been hijacked. So Islam is a problem. Yeah. Now what can we do then to change their culture? We know what we can do for us, we but can. we still need to change yeah. their culture. Can, so how can we change Islam? See the question, the answer is this, how can you change a movement uh, in which you have 1.5 billion members? It's impossible. We just have to resist it and just elect people who are willing just to resist it and just be pro-American. That's the only answer. We're not going to change Islam. Okay. That's, I addressed it, I'll answer that. I addressed it in my presentation. There are a lot of cultural Muslims. Uh, they're not a problem, but unfortunately, they're not the solution either. When was the last, when was the last time you heard a cultural Muslim criticizing radical Islam? 
And a lot of them, listen, a lot of them don't even know the Quran. When I talk, when I discuss the Quran with them, the conversation lasts for two and a half minutes. They just know the tip of the iceberg. And as you know, 90% of an iceberg is submerged. They can see the forest, but they can't see the trees. So that's the problem. Can I say well, and, Yes. And I, and I want to say something, because I know that a lot of people here don't believe that Islam has been hijacked, but I said it in the beginning. I believe that the radicals, the radical Islamists, have hijacked Islam. And I said that in my very beginning, because I believe that. I truly believe that there are those who have of, of a different faith than I, they're Muslim, that aren't out to harm other people. But they are concerned that if they speak up, yes. they may be um, punished by these radical Islamists. Because, you know, like any other religion, if you are not with them, then you are against them, is the radical Islam's way of doing things. And so, yes. And so that, that's what I meant when I said, you know, you've got, you, you've got a group of people. What is the Quran about? Like, if I want to know what is Christianity about, I'm going to go read the Bible, and I'm going to know what is the message of the Bible. So if I'm really a Muslim, if I, if I truly am a Muslim and I read the Quran and I follow the Quran, what does the Quran say? So that's why I think that the whole being relative and everybody's got to, you know, be not, not be politically correct. But I'm saying that if you're really a Muslim, whether you're radical or not, if you read the Quran and, and, and if, if it, you know, is saying if you're an infidel, then you need to be killed, then that's how can that be peaceful? How can that not be good side by side? Like that? that's, that's where you have the influences of some of the groups, which is a term that's but that's when you have to read the radical clerics. Because so something you didn't address in your presentation that I think is really critical is the socioeconomic status of a lot of the young men that you talked about. You see a lot of the young men and even now young women, they're young, unemployed, disenfranchised, and so they have this sense of belonging. You know, when they go to these progressions, people who are given them value, and that's where they find their value. And that that's really a critical element. But in that same argument, you now have given a reason for someone to become part of a gang. That's right. And so, what is a gang? It's a criminal element. It's terrorist. Yeah, I, I say So, you know, and I, and I'm, can you repeat, can you repeat I just, the question, please? She, what she said was that it, because of their socioeconomics, because of uh, different things involved in their, and that's an element of it. And what I said was, you could say that about becoming a gang member, be involved in gangs. The reality is, in our country, in this great country, we have opportunities if we are willing to work for them. Yeah. And I've heard over and over again how people, you know, well, I guess then I shouldn't be here today. Because, one, I grew up in an enlisted man's family, one of four children. And he did what he could to take care of us. And by all accounts, I will tell you, he was a great father and is still a great father. And he taught us all that we could be or do anything we wanted, as long as we were willing to, one, work for it. Amen. Work for it. You have to make the choices. I can give you the foundation, but you have to make those choices and you have to be willing to work for it. I found myself a single parent. By all accounts, I could have just thrown up my hands and said, you know, I didn't have a high school diploma, and I didn't have a job, but I had a child to support. And so I taught her the same thing my father taught me. And that was, you can be anything or do anything you want, as long as you're willing to work for it. So, Amen. I went out and got my GED. I put myself through the police academy at night while working during the day, and I became a police officer. And I took care of my daughter. And by all accounts, I could have been one of those people that everybody likes to talk about. Part of, you know, Gibbies. the people that just give up. Gibbies. The issue isn't, do you have the opportunity? Not here in this country, because you do. The issue is, are you willing to reach for that opportunity, get more for that opportunity, and grasp that opportunity? And a lot of our children these days are not being taught that. They're being taught that they should be given that. 
and what I believe from our government is that we should give the opportunity for people to grow. The opportunity, not give them food, but teach them how to grow food. How to, you know, that saying, give them a fish they ate today, but teach them how to fish the forever. Amen. So these are the things that we are lacking here lately. And that's off topic, but I really believe that we have to think about that. What the doctor said is over in a lot of these Muslim countries, the culture is what's driving this. And it's radicalizing these children very young. And that's all they know. And so we have an issue with how do we address it here in this country? Do we address it for what it is? Or do we try to be politically correct and see what happens when we do that? We watch as more Americans and more innocent people die. And, he, and he's right. I can remember as a police officer looking at these different terrorist groups. And I've been trained, and I've worked in a lot of different areas within the agency. And I know there's a lot of people out there that have different ideas, and they have different ways of promoting their ideas, one of which is through acts of violence. But this particular group doesn't care. They're indiscriminate when they attack. And the more <coughs> casualties, the better for them. Thank and you. that's where the problem lies. Yeah. Because there are a lot of innocent men, women, and children who had nothing to do with their fight. And we have to stop being politically correct on this. We have to address it for what it truly is. Amen. I agree. I agree. And I think we're now at the point of the program where the good doctor is going to be doing a book signing. He's got his books here. So uh, please, everyone, stop by and chat. Let's uh, give the doctor a round of applause. Thank you again, Sandy Adams. Thank you so much for nice